your announcements there at the start here. Please make sure you hand in your fourth assignment that's due today, either electronically or on paper. And then, uh, just an announcement, actually, this is before 4N for the other course. If you weren't there this morning, uh, just to draw your attention to the fact that 4N on tomorrow's class is the guest speaker um, who's an alumnus of the university, 50-year alumnus from the university, coming to give a guest talk on innovation. It will be a really good talk. Um, I know some students from other classes are actually coming to this as well. So feel free to invite any of your other friends and colleagues to the 9.30 class tomorrow on Wednesday for that talk. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back then to where we ended off last time. We were talking here about equilibrium modeling in adsorption and we wanted to derive a way that we can relate our concentrations in the bulk phase with the concentration on the surface of the adsorbent. And the mechanism by which we do that is through an isotherm. So isotherms tell us how much is remaining in the bulk and in equilibrium with what's adsorbed. So the mental picture we can have in mind is if you have a container here, you've got adsorbent and then in equilibrium with that adsorbent we have some of the material we're absorbing, the adsorbate or the solute. happens is that the solute will adsorb onto the surface and into the pores of the adsorbent. So internally to this adsorbent, we will get material adsorbed on it. So the terminology we use then is CA, is the concentration of the adsorbent. So, and the units of that is kilograms of A per meter cube of fluid. So that's what's remaining in, in the liquid phase or the, or the fluid phase around the adsorbent. That's what's left over. And that's in equilibrium with CAS, which is the concentration of A on that surface or inside that adsorbent. measure the units, different concentration units actually, of kilograms of A per kilogram of adsorbent. So that's where we ended off the previous class and we had looked at some ways in which we can relate those two concentrations to each other. The simplest of which is an, a linear isotherm or simply Henry's law that shows and tells us that that concentration of A on the surface and inside is linearly related to the concentration in the bulk phase. So CA on the left hand side, sorry on the right hand side, multiplied by a constant K gives you CAS. Okay. So we really know one and we're interested in computing the other. CA is really easy to measure, CAS is not, not easy to measure at all. But we can find the CAS's by an aspects. And so last time we went through an example where, um, here's that example that we looked at. We had said, if we, re we recall back there, we were considering a batch system where we took a bench scale experiment first, with one liter of solution, 0.05 grams per liter of A, and we had only three grams of adsorbent. So we did that experiment, allowed it to come into equilibrium, with the adsorbent, and we found that 96% of the contaminant was removed. So our starting amount, we started off with 0.05 grams per liter multiplied by one liter, so we had 0.05 grams per liter, sorry, we had 0.05 grams to start, and that distributed itself into two portions, 0.048 was adsorbed, and then the remaining remains in solution. From that 
passed out. So the concentration then in the bulk phase is 0.02 grams per one liter remaining. Adsorbed is 0.048 grams per three grams of adsorbent that we had. So CAS and CA can be calculated. That gets us a single data point over there. That intersection of CA and CAS was found over there. And then the slope K can be computed then and we had a value of 8. And we had said last time that the units of CA, uh, sorry, of K over there <coughs> will obviously depend on your units of CA and CAS. So here we're using kilograms of per meter cube of fluid. Some textbooks will use grams per liter. Um, when it comes to CAS, some, some books and references will use parts per million. Okay, so PPM is simply a ratio of two masses, parts per million. So be careful what your units are. K will always take on the units of the left and the right hand side so that it, that equation um, is consistent. And in this case, units of, of K are eight meters cubed per kilogram. Okay, so I did a bit of simplification there. It's also equal to eight. And if you worked in the original units, it would be meters per gram. Okay, or simply eight meters cubed per kilogram. So that's our lab scale K. That was our, our plan last time, was we were going to calculate the lab scale K, which we now have. Then we're going to take that over and do the full scale um, experiment. And the full scale experiment says, if we look at the rest of the information given to us, now we're using that same adsorbent to treat a, a stream of 400 liters. So 400 liters this time, still 0 0.05 grams per liter. And we're asking how much adsorbent do we need to get that contaminant down to 99%. So in the lab scale, I got it down to 96%. In the full scale, I'd like to get it to 99%. Take a minute or two to work on this. Uh, set up your plan, and you don't need to calculate it, but set up how you're going to compute that 4.95 kilogram answer then. On using the lab scale data on, at the full scale. So it's yeah, 400 liters of aqueous feed with 0.05 grams per liter contaminant. Suggested approaches for part two. What do we know? What don't we know for part two? Oh, no, 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 no. Right. Yeah, I'm learning. 
Okay, so CA is not 0 0.05 grams per liter. This is a common, common misconception. CA is not 0 0.05 grams per liter. One percent of that. Okay, so we start off. Again, same same ideas. We uh, we want to do a mass balance to calculate CA and CA. So if we if we think of our plan here, we know what K is. Our goal here is to find these two concentrations: the concentration in solution and the concentration on the adsorbent. So we want to know both CAS and CA. I only know K so far. I can calculate CAS and CA from a mass balance and using that 99% criteria over there. And then the second part of the question we can solve because once we know CAS, we call CAS as units of grams of A per gram of adsorbent. If I know CAS, I can then calculate that grams of adsorbent. So let's see how we do that in this uh, part one and two. We'll solve them pretty much simultaneously. So at the large scale, the full scale mass balance says we add 400 liters, 0 0.5 grams per liter, so this is mass in. And that's going to distribute itself in two ways, as the mass adsorbed as well as the mass remaining. Okay, so mass adsorbed in this case is equal to uh, what's left over. Mass remaining, we want that to be 99%. So 99% times 400 times 0 0.05 is what we want to remain, and that is equal to 0 0.2 grams remaining. Ninety-nine percent is a mass adsorbed. That would be nineteen point eight grams. Would be adsorbed. Okay, so from that mass remaining, then I can get CA. CA is equal to zero point two grams per four hundred liters, which is equal to zero point three zero five grams per liter. Then using that constant K of 8, I can get CAS is equal to 8 gram, liters per gram multiplied by 305 grams per liter. And I get an answer there of 0 0.04, uh, 204 grams per gram. Okay, so that's CA and CAS for part one of the question. Part two of the question calls us or asks us to find out how much adsorbent we need. Well we need enough adsorbent on there so that we end up with 0 0.04 grams per gram. That comes from 19.8 grams that gets adsorbed. So 19.8 grams of solutes needs to be adsorbed so that we end up with a concentration of 0 0.04. So massive adsorbent required, we'll call capital S, that's equal to 19.8 grams divided by 19.8 uh, divided by 0 0.04.
so that's with the linear relationship between CA and CAS. And in many instances, that linear relationship holds particularly for dilute solutions. So if you look here at CA and CAS, these values are very small. They're very, very dilute. And CA, that's where that relationship there is likely to be fairly linear. Now, it doesn't make sense for a linear relationship to hold because a linear relationship implies that we can increase CAS without bound as long as we just increase CA. And we know that it's not possible for our adsorbent to pick up that amount of material. So we can go and derive alternative relationships between CA and CAS that are more realistically uh, representative of situations. And as you said, and suggested here in the class last time that that curve should have a sort of convex, convex shape so that it tapers off. The one way we can do that is simply raise that CA to a particular constant that's smaller than one, and that's exactly what the phonic isotherm does. So as M gets larger and larger, that curve uh, curves down more and more, um, bringing that sort of realistic relationship to bear. Now that constant M is purely empirical. We have to compute this from lab experiments, and we discussed what those lab experiments would look like last class. Then we glossed over this particular derivation of the isotherm, the Langmuir isotherm, which is probably a derivation for those of you that are taking 4K. We're looking at this in terms of reactor design with, with catalysts and catalyst sites where, re where reactions occur. So in fact, we can follow that same sort of thinking for adsorption. If you conceptually consider adsorption to be a reaction, and what you can have in mind is this picture where you've got adsorbent loading onto a site, and consider that to be a chemical reaction, though there is no reaction taking place. But the binding of that adsorbent to the site is conceptually a reaction. So one. One visualization you might consider is the following. If I've got a surface, so I've got my material diffusing inside this pore, and there are these sites. So I might consider them parking lots or areas where molecules can, can place themselves. And so if a molecule of A comes and seats itself at that site, here's a particular site S on the surface. And another molecule A can come sit here on the surface S over there, and so forth. I can have these molecules A loading up sequentially onto a site S. So it's conceptually as if there's a reaction occurring with A plus S in equilibrium, and we'll call the combination of it once it's together here AS. So this is the, the joint. AS, and then there's molecules of A coming in, and there's a whole number of vacant sites S that are available for molecules to load onto. Okay, so CAS then is the number of occupied sites. CAS is an occupied site. So it's the number of moles of sites per kilogram of adsorbent. Okay is one way to conceptually consider that. There's a concentration of vacant sites, so the more vacant sites you have available, CB, and then CT is the total sites available to you. Now, if we consider that as a first order reaction, we've got a site available and we've got molecules A available, the rate of reaction in the forward direction, let's call that K subscript A, so lowercase k, that rate of reaction Ka is going to be that forward reaction rate Ka multiplied by the concentration of A multiplied by the number of vacant sites. So let's, let's and you're all seeing Pa there, and I'm talking about Ca. So why Pa versus Ca? Well, let me just put it out here that Pa is the partial pressure of A for dealing with gas phase systems is equal to Ca times R times T. Okay, so when you see Pa, it's the partial pressure of the solute A. It's no difference to Ca. So Pa 
PA and CA are often used interchangeably. PA is, is used with gas-based systems. CA is used for liquid-based systems. But PA can always be converted over to CA. Okay. So it's, it's helpful to think of this in gas phase systems because you've got a molecule of A diffusing through the gas phase and lo loading up onto a site. But it's no different for liquids either. Okay, so this rate, this forward rate, is equal to the, this rate constant Ka multiplied by the concentration of A multiplied by the concentration of vacant sites. The more vacant sites you have available, the greater that forward reaction rate. The, more, the greater the concentration of A available, that greater that forward reaction. So that's conceptually intuitive from right reaction kinetics. Now, these molecules of A will adsorb and desorb from the site. So they'll load up as well as move away. And the rate of then desorbing is proportional to the number of sites that are occupied. So the reverse reaction rate constant, K minus A, exists here as well. So we can run that reaction backwards. And that's proportional to the number of occupied sites. So the reverse rate is K subscript minus A times CAS. forward reaction rate minus the reverse reaction rate gives me my net rate. Okay, and when the system is in equilibrium, that net reaction rate is zero. So the same way we derived these concepts in reactor design in 3K, we set, set that net rate equal to zero. That gives us one equation. We also have another equation where we use capital Ka as the equilibrium constant, which is the ratio of the forward and the reverse reaction rates. So we can define that reaction rate constant, sorry, we can define that equilibrium constant exactly in the same way as you did it in reactor design. And we can then use that capital Ka in the derivation here, instead of uh, K subscript A and K subscript minus A. So the math is over there for you to read through. It's a bit of substitution, but the key, the key result that we get is once we set that rate, that first equation up there equal to zero, once we set that, I can rearrange that equation. <coughs> CAS is equal to some other sequence of constants as a function of CA. So you can plot then that relationship between CA and CAS and it has that naturally tapered off shape that we expect. So, CA plotted versus CAS will start at zero as well, because when CA is zero in that equation, the last equation in the box, and CA is zero, CAS is also zero, and those constants are all positive constants, and for positive constants, that curve has that, uh, that shape. Now, I will also just draw your attention to that equation there is often written in an alternative form. So K3 multiplied by CA. And it's often written then as K, I'll use K5 plus the C. So divide the numerator and the denominator through by K4, and you can get that sort of relationship. So you'll often see it expressed in that form as well. And as I said in the last class, that's very similar in structure to the michaelis manton model that uh, bio people have used. Okay, so we find those constants K3 and K5 if we're expressing it in this format. You can rearrange that equation and linearize it. So please uh, note when that purple over there is a hyperlink to a Wikipedia page on it that will show you <coughs> how, to, how to rearrange it. But it's straight, fairly straightforward. Rearrange this and for a given set of data points of CA versus CAS. So for lab experiments, you'll collect CA values, you'll collect CAS values. Like four or five 
do four or five experiments at different concentrations of CA and measure the resulting CAS. You can then find those constants K3 and K5 from a nonlinear curve fit or use the E of C diagram to, to, find, to linearize that equation and then find the slope and the intercepts to calculate K3 and K5. So many of you have used line weaver work, right? That terminology is familiar, the line weaver work plot. No. no? Okay, good, because that's a bad way of doing it. <laughs> e e half c is far preferred and gets much lower error in the coefficient estimates than one in the <coughs> So I highly recommend you just read that article there um, for people that are in the bio area. Okay, so isotherms are easy to come by once we do a few lab experiments. Now, that's not the only isotherm available to us, the linear and this uh, Langer isotherm. What you do though is when you perform a laboratory experiment, you have no idea ahead of the time if the curve is going to have a Freundlich shape, or a Langer shape, or a linear shape. Um, it, it really depends where, you, where you're collecting the data. If we're collecting our data in this region over here, a linear relationship will work just fine if you're in this narrow space. If you're over a much wider range of compositions, concentrations, you will need to use a Freundlich isotherm or Langer isotherm. But going into the experiment, you have no idea where you're going to end up. So the process is fairly iterative. You will do your experimental work, you propose a model, fit the data <coughs> to that model, and you check your goodness of fit. So all the stuff we look at in the statistics course next term for C, or you've done in your stats course already. So we, we do that on an iterative basis and we try different <coughs> models until we get a good fit. Now, let's assume we have that model. So here's an example of that. So I've done some experimental work, four or five experiments, and I get this shape. Okay, so I, I have a good idea that just from the shape of that data that this is a Langmuir isotherm. I've gone ahead and done the work and fit the Langmuir coefficients and there they are. Over there in that form. So we're going to look at this question, but before we dive into it, I just want to talk a little bit about some, some theory here on batch systems, which comes up in the context of adsorption all the time. So let's, uh, let's take a look at just some of that quick before we move into this example. So this isotherm then is telling me the relationship between CA on the horizontal axis and CAS on the vertical axis. And it's going to be some usually nonlinear relationship. There's another equation that we can derive that will also relate CA to CAS when we're dealing with batch systems. So this is, it. This is important for batch systems. form a, a batch mass balance in the same way as we did in the prior example. Let's just do this symbolically though. In a batch, I have my reactor. This valve is shut. I feed material into the batch with a certain volume V. So a certain volume of liquid V in there. And mix up. So add material, mix to equilibrium, and then you can measure CA. CA is very easy to measure. You take a sample of the liquid phase, so you've got adsorbent in here in the, in the reactor. That's loaded up. A lot of your material that you've added and then afterwards you measure CA, the composition in the liquid phase remain. And you can also then measure or calculate CAS. So if we do that symbolically, we'll say mass added
some mass, capital M, that you added initially. So we know how much material we've added in there. So that's mass added. And let's be specific here. This is adsorbate. So your species, we usually call this A. So maybe we'll make it a bit more specific mass of A, so N subscript A. The certain amount of material we've added to the system. And that mass distributes itself in two ways. It will be either adsorbed onto the adsorbent or it will remain in solution in equilibrium with it. So that mass then distributes as and it goes two terms, mass adsorbed and mass still in solution. So symbolically then MA can be written as the mass adsorbed is the amount of adsorbent in kilograms multiplied by CAS. Okay, so that's kilograms of adsorbent. multiplied by kilograms of A per kilogram of adsorbent. Those are the units for that. S times CAS. And the mass that's still in solution is equal to CA times the V volume V. So that's equal to kilograms of A per meter cubed times meter cubed. So that mass balance is consistent in the units then. And there you see a relationship between CA and CAS. There's another relationship that we've now derived over there that relates <coughs> CA to CAS in terms of some constants, the volume V and that mass MA. But those are two values we do know. And S is another value we know. So if we rewrite that equation then, M, N subscript A is equal to CAS times S plus CA times V. We can rewrite it so that we can relate CA S is equal to so in the same way we write our isotherm as CAS as a function of CA, we can write that CAS here is equal to MA divided by S minus CA times V over S. Okay, and that's a linear relationship. So with that new knowledge now that you have, we now have a linear relationship that tells me how CAS and CA are related. We also have the isotherm relationship. Let's take a look at this problem. I'll give you a minute to read it, and then another two, three minutes for you to plan a strategy to find the answer. <coughs> what is it that we're looking for, and how are you going to get to that point?
And so the answer isn't the issue here, it's given to you in fact, but what's more important is that you plan your approach here in a systematic manner. So our unknowns, in this case, <coughs> CAS, and CA. So that's what our goal is, is to find those two. Uh, we also asked to calculate the recovery. The recovery is going to be a function of CAS um, and what we started off. <coughs> So, what's our strategy here? Or if we're exploring this problem, let's take a look. I mean, explore is obvious because we've just covered the topic. So it's obvious that we're going to be using these equations we've just uh, been looking at. So that, that's the exploration step. But how are we going to find CAS and CA? What does it mean here when the system is in equilibrium? If I say the system is in equilibrium, how are you going to use that piece of information? <coughs> uh, if it's in equilibrium, you have an equilibrium equation that you can use. So we can use this equilibrium equation, which means that we must be operating <coughs> on that line. So we're going to be somewhere on this line. We're just not sure where. So you can draw a line that looks like a line that connects these, these uh, cross points up. Okay, so we're going to have something where we're along this, this green line. We're just not sure where along that line we are. How might I find where I'm going to be along that line? Okay, so 2.5 meters cubed multiplied by 0.25. Is that what you're saying? So 2.5 meters cubed multiplied by 2.5 kilograms per meter cubed. equations for two unknowns. Does that seem reasonable? Simon's approach was to calculate CA and then find CAS. Okay, how do we find CA? Do we have enough information to calculate CA? What you should not do is multiply that 2.5 meters cubed times 0.25 kilograms per meter cubed and call that CA. Okay, that's not CA. That's simply what you're adding to the system initially. 
is two and a half meters cubed of wastewater with 0.25 kilograms of phenol per meter cubed. That's your inlet concentration, for sure, is not CA. That inlet concentration, that's mass added, essentially. That's what that is, is equal to MA. So MA, in fact, is equal to 2.5 times 0.25. Okay, so that's 0 0.625, 0 0.625 kilograms of A was added to the system. So that 0.625 distributes itself into two portions. Some portion is adsorbed, another portion remains in solution. So we now have MA in this equation. Do we have S? Yep, we have S and do we have V? Rolling V, we do. Okay, so if let's if we write out that equation, then we have essentially we could write out. Uh, I'm going to go back to that form over there. M A is equal to S times C A S plus V times C A. If we sum in the numbers, we get 0 0.625 is equal to three times C A S plus 2.5 CA. Okay, or rearranging then, we can find, the, find another equation. So um, let's see, that's CAS. Well, actually, let me take a look at it this way. Here's CAS is MAS minus V over S. V is positive, S is positive. So my slope is negative. So I know if I superimpose that line onto this diagram, I'm going to have a negative slope. So it's going to be something of that form. And the intercept here on the y-axis is equal to the case where CA is 0, so that's equal to MA divided by S. So intercept. In this case, it's 0.625 kilograms divided by S, which is how much? 3 kilograms. Okay, it's equal to 0 0.21, approximately. So over here is 0 0.21. And the, where it cuts the x-axis then is when CAS is equal to zero. We can solve for that as well. And that cuts at 0.25. Once we know those two, two points, we know it's a straight line from the equation. We can draw through that and cut, cut across that. So everyone see how I calculate 0.21 over there? Yeah. Yes? No? Yeah. 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 Okay, easy. And then 0.25 down here is where CAS is equal to 0. Set that equal to 0 and solve for CA. Okay, and then you can solve it graphically. I don't really care for solving it particularly to high accuracy here. So you cut it, cut it across diagonally. Once you join this line up visually with your eye and cut across the diagonal over here, you'll find that the points intersect, oh, sorry, those two lines rather intersect coincidentally close to that x or that stop. It's not that it happens to be exactly there, but it's just coincidence that's pretty close to it. Yes, so for the solution, we can use that equation we see as Yes, in the black equation up there. Yeah. So how do you use that? This is the equation we derived for a batch mass balance. This is a batch system. So yes, it applies. Yeah. So um, if you just, like, can you use the equation of the equation of C as it is? Yeah, if you want to do it by you know, uh, algebraically. Yeah, but wouldn't that be more accurate than using the graph? Close enough, point one. Yeah. But this is all experimental data. There's errors in it. How do we calculate the recovery of 58%? We 
recovery balance equations for that? Yeah. You look at the uh, CAS, so it's a total kilogram of absorbent per kilogram of the carbon, so you know how much carbon you put in. Okay, so you can figure out how much you actually took out, and then you divide that by how much it's in. Okay, so recovery of A is phenol. So how much phenol did we recover is equal to mass adsorbed divided by mass started off with, or initial mass. So in terms of our symbolic notation, the mass adsorbed is equal to CAS times S. And the initial mass is equal to um, MA. Okay, so if uh, we sub in over there, CAS is 0.12. Multiplied by S was 3 kilograms. And MA is equal to the product of that's 2.5 times 0.25. You get a recovery of about 0 0.58. So, yes. so our phenol, we recovered 58% of it. If this was a uh, this is a wastewater treatment problem, the other percentage, the other 40 some percent gets distributed in the wastewater, we're not able to absorb that. 